PhotoShelter is the leader in online portfolio websites and tools for professional photographers. We help you get business, do business, and keep business. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi speaking to you from the Photo Shelter World Headquarters here in New York. We have a great presentation here today uh, with a very interesting guy. But before we get to that, let me give you some uh, housekeeping notes over to the right of your computer. You should see a go to uh, webinar control panel. And from that uh, control panel, you can ask us questions as we go along. Uh, we have two people kind of helping out today. We have Sarah Jacobs from our office at Photo Shelter and Meg Rodney from Lens Pro to Go, who will also be answering questions for you. Um, so any technical questions or business questions, we'll do our best to answer those for you. Um, and we are also live tweeting this along. So if you're one of those Twitter people, go ahead and use the hashtag PSWebinar. Um, to tweet interesting things that you hear or ask us rhetorical questions or what have you, or controversial things. And with that, let me introduce you to Michael Duvall, who's a wedding photographer. Um, and Michael was telling me he shoots somewhere in the range of 20 weddings a year, and he has a full-time job and three kids at Lens Pro to Go. Um, <laughs> Michael, welcome. Uh, hi, glad to be here. Um, Michael, why don't you tell us a little bit about your wedding photography business and how long you've been doing this? Sure. Um, well, I you know, started with photography back in high school, and uh, you know, started there. Took my passion for photo and cars, put it together, and um, started shooting cars. That was kind of where I I got my start in photography, and uh, went to college, <clears throat> studied uh, photography in school, uh, met my wonderful wife Kate uh, there, and we kind of you know we started uh, shooting, um, but neither of us would have had anything to do with wedding photography. Uh, it was, you know, if you think of the stereotypical wedding photographer, I mean, that was the last thing on our minds uh, for photo. But uh, we got married in 2005, and we had so much fun at our wedding. It was unbelievable. Um, our wedding photographers, uh, they were okay. Um, they certainly left a lot to be desired. I'm not really sure how we hired them, being photographers, but regardless. Uh, and that was it. That was the you know catalyst for Kate and I to decide. You know, we had so much fun. Um, I really think that we could do a better job at this. And uh, the rest was history. Just I've heard so many photographers who who've sworn that they wouldn't shoot weddings, and then a few years later they're shooting it. I mean, it, talk about a, at least a niche that that never ends in terms of people needing that type of photography versus you know journalism or automotive photography. Since you were you were doing that, right, right. Um, I mean. 20 weddings a year and people always get married huh yeah it's uh I mean, it's sort of like you know the funeral industry it's there's there's always new customers so uh and so you've been working at lens pro to go which is one of the major uh, uh camera and lens uh, rental houses uh, in the u.s um mm -hmm. and tell how how fun is that on a day-to-day -day basis just to get access to all the equipment and see new <laughs> things as they're rolling out the door um i mean it's fantastic i'm i'm a gearhead uh, at heart, so um, you know Nikon model numbers, obscure obs accessories. It's all you know <laughs> packed away in my brain up there. Um, so yeah, I mean it's fantastic. We get to get our hands on gear. Um, you know we get to usually be among the first people in the country just just to touch this stuff. You know which is a great privilege. And and everyone here is a shooter, so we certainly take you know the advantage of being able to get our hands on all of this stuff. Uh, and put it to good use to be able to, you know, inform customers and, and you know, give people our input on how this stuff actually works in the field. So walk us through some of uh, the wedding images that you've, you've taken in the past here and, and tell us kind of how you conceived of them and if there were any executional challenges. Sure. Um, you know, this one is uh, in, in Harvard Square um, in Boston. And, you know, it's, it, this couple had a, a fantastic nighttime um, fall city wedding so we wanted to try and capture some of the elements of the hustle and bustle of the city uh, so you know it, the background is pretty much a, a slow shutter ambient exposure um, and we you know we kept the shutter speed really slow so we could get that that background blur um, we put the couple in a, a fairly dark pocket so that there wasn't a ton of exposure for them um, and then just did a rear curtain sink flash off camera through an umbrella just to sort of light them up um, it's fun. I mean, this is this is what you get to do when you get comfortable with your with your gear. You can play and and you know get a few safe images in the bag and then you know try to push it. 
So was this something that you kind of saw the opportunity to shoot and then you then you shot it or was this kind of in your mental shot list before you went into the wedding? Um, generally, we try not to go into weddings with a predefined list of stuff we want to shoot. We kind of let the location sort of, you know, present opportunities. Um, so, yeah, this was just sort of on the fly. Uh, this next image that we're looking at, the uh, I guess it kind of blends the automotive photography with the wedding photography. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things I mean, in, in when I was shooting cars, I spent so much time hanging out of the uh, out of a passenger window at 70 miles an hour, um, which leads to very interesting hairstyles. Uh, when you get out. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, this is one that, you know, the secret to these kinds of, you know, what we call tracking shots where, you know, your car, your car that you're in and the car that you're photographing traveling at the same speed. Um, you know, the background is always moving. Um, so if you slow the shutter speed down enough, you get that, that nice, you know, pan blur action in the background. And um, it's just fun. I mean, it's, you know, this was a, a group of guys that were definitely very into this Hummer. So uh, um, this was a shot that, you know, that meant a lot to them. The, uh, I mean, the, the, the pan blur is kind of almost a necessity to have to make this kind of shot work effectively wouldn't you say yeah i mean if you if your shutter speed is too high um the wheels end up looking frozen and it it basically looks like a car that's you know that's parked on the road yeah yeah um which isn't particularly inspiring you do have to shoot a lot of frames um otherwise uh you end up with a lot of stuff that isn't sharp so and is that something that you just kind of hit the motor drive for yeah yeah and you wait <laughs> for the, the right shot uh for it all to come together um, we're looking at this next image here and so much about good composition is about foreground and background elements. And, and this is obviously one where you have a nice defocused foreground element where the eye just goes straight to the couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think layering, that's one of my favorite things to play with. I, I tend to shoot with longer lenses. Um, you know, when the, my my photo brain works that it's usually through a more telephoto -y lens. Um, and it is, it's great. It's the, I think the thing that's really awesome about telephoto lenses is that just subtle movements. I mean, even, you know, ducking down one foot can change drastically what the background and foreground looks like. Um, so the longer lenses to me are, are sort of where I find a lot more creative outlet to be able to stack things up and play with compositions and, and all that stuff. So this is, you know, one of those shots that it just kind of works. So. You know, we're going to talk about checklisting gear later in the presentation, but what, what's, mm -hmm. wh how much gear are you typically taking to a wedding? Um, it depends. I mean, if, if we're doing a lot of traveling on foot, we try to run as light as possible. Um, so, you know, a basic uh, speed light, off-camera speed light kit, you know, which would be one camera for controlling, uh, or sorry, one flash rather, to control the other flash. So a master-slave type setup. Um, a basic modifier, we've really paired our lighting modifiers down to just a simple 42-inch um, two-stop diffuser, which gives us lots of flexibility and doesn't, isn't cumbersome like an umbrella. Mm -hmm. um, so we do that. And then, you know, just a camera body, um, a backup camera body. Uh, and, and sometimes we pair it down as simply, simple as just like 24 to 70 and 7200. Um, but we'll often pepper primes in you know, for specific applications. Yeah. Yeah. I love this, uh, group shot. And, you know, when people think of, of wedding portrait photography, I think people still have these ideas from the seventies and eighties in their head and they're, you know, mm -hmm. putting them in an urban setting and lining them up with kind of unconventional poses makes it look so contemporary. Yeah. I mean, this was, this was a really fun wedding. Uh, this particular bride sort of went, went all out on the details. Um, so you know, this, this sort of color pattern here sort of worked. This happened to be a location that was, you know, incredibly convenient to the, you know, the rest of the shoot. Um, and yeah, that juxtaposition of sort of that, you know, fancy sort of uh, wedding attire with this, you know, broken down, um, you know, sort of dilapidated building kind of background. It's, uh, it's just fun. Are you finding that clients are asking for kind of formal portraits or, you know, there was a trend a few years ago about everybody wanted that photojournalistic look and maybe portraits weren't necessary. Are you still kind of balancing the two? 
yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I, I don't think really that many folks ever really wanted pure photojournalism. Um, you know, where they're like, oh, we're not going to do formal photos. Like, it's, it's one of those things that I wonder if those couples ever regretted that decision. Um, <laughs> because, they're, you know, the, the, when you look at the photos of what people view the most, which ones they, you know, certainly which ones they're purchasing, um, you know, it's by far, it's those, you know, those formal photos. And if anything, it's the photos that your parents relate to because that's what they're, is in their mind. Right, um, right. So certainly it's a balance of, you know, having the fun stuff, but also, I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a, you know, a nice straight up portrait. Yeah, you know, and along those same lines, I, I can't remember what the source was, but I think it was, you know, one of these wedding magazines or something. They did a survey of brides and they said, what is kind of the biggest regret uh, from from mm-hmm. your wedding? And a lot of them said, we wish we'd spent more money on photography. Yeah. Almost implying like, you know, they got the cheapest that they could get and they were regretful mm-hmm. of, of the results. I mean, the thing that we always say to our clients, you know, it sounds self-serving, um, but it really isn't meant to be. It's that the photography is the only thing that you're left with other than your spouse <laughs> after the wedding. You know, like we had a, a photographer friend who's in the business who said, I spent more money on my flowers than I did on my photographer. And I have a bunch of mediocre photos of really expensive flowers. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, before we move to the next one, we're getting a lot of questions about this particular image. Is this all ambient sure. light? What sort of what sort of lens and what sort of settings were you using for this? Sure. So this is the vast majority of this is ambient light. Um, there is a small amount of fill um, through that same diffuser. Um, and what we did here in this particular image on a, on a group shot that's of this size, um, what we do is we tend to feather um, the flash. And what we would do is we'd point it. Um, at the grouping um, on the right hand side um, so that the people on the left are getting slightly lit um, you know sort of with the like spill from the diffuser Mm -hmm. and uh, you know the folks on the right are getting the vast majority of the power but that's it's just a touch uh, of lighting there just to sort of give them a little bit of um, you know a little bit of contrast yeah and and you're getting pretty good kind of foreground and background separation. So I assume this is a, mm-hmm. a little bit of a longer lens. It is. Yep. This is with a 70 to 200. Um, and this, this alleyway was, my gosh, it was probably, uh, 150 yards long. Um, it was huge. So, so there was plenty of room for us to back up. I'd be, I don't have the exact, but I would be willing to bet this is right at 200 to give you that compression. Oh, wow. And what sort of posing guidance are you giving the people when you're taking this kind of group shot? Um, this one is certainly a little bit more posed than our normal style. Um, you know, we kind of had, uh, you know, the two groupings on the left and right hold hands. Um, and then, you know, the couple in the middle just happened to, you know, they made a joke, uh, and we're looking at each other and this was, this was the frame that, you know, all the, all of their expressions aligned. So yeah. So yeah. Really um, and then uh, I think this is the last one of, of the images. And speaking of sure. flower photos, this happens to be a really <laughs> nice flower photo. Yeah. Um, yeah, this was, uh, this was pure, pure location luck. Um, this was at the bride's house. And um, it was sort of a neat, it was like a little covered walkway portico type thing that connected their house to the garage. So it was basically, it was a, a roof. Um, with you know open sky on both sides which just gave this you know perfectly classical you know side lit um scenario and it was you know midday so the sun was right overhead it just i don't know and the color contrast between the the blue wall and yeah, the flowers it's amazing. yeah i mean it was one of those ones that you you took you look at the back of the camera and you're like oh wow this is great I and mean, it looked better in the in the camera than it didn't really like, so, <laughs> um that was a that was a good one uh and the fireworks shot was, you know, it was, it was great. The couple, um, for this one, uh, the husband had built their own fireworks raft out of um, plastic bins and this giant sheet of four by eight plywood where they had, you know, stapled down this entire thing. So there was one guy that like swam out and was lighting the fireworks off this like custom fused fireworks show. Um, so I ended up climbing up to the roof of the building just to try and get the tent in the background and the water. Um, and yeah, it's just, you know, try to, try to tell the story. It's the things that the couple 
Uh, you know, if they put a lot of time and effort into it, you know, it's probably a good shot to try and, you know, execute creatively. Now that you've been shooting weddings for eight years, do you find yeah. yourself taking a little more chances in terms of trying to get that extra shot? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I give a lot of credit, thankfully. Um, you know, it's a luxury that, that we don't take for granted is that my wife and I shoot together 95% of the time, um, you know, and the the complete knowledge of, of what we're shooting, um, I can look at Kate, I know, you know, what she's shooting based on, you know, the lens she has on, and I just, you know, I can always count on her to get the kiss. Uh, me, I'm always, you know, hit or miss. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but that's, it's, it's great. We have that relationship um, that she'll know I'm getting details and close-ups of the parents during the ceremony so we have our own sort of set routine um, so I'll be able to say to Kate if I have an idea I want to execute it like all right you cover this and, and I don't have to think twice that you know that there will be any suffering for coverage um, if you want to try something I guess I that's pretty important when you're working with a second shooter or when you are the second shooter really kind of designating beforehand or having some sort of hand signal thing about who's gonna get what shot Absolutely. I mean, and, and it's it's fun. I mean, that that's the the creative part. If you if you're able to, you know, if you have that idea and that spark, there's nothing worse than driving home with the thought of like, oh, I wish I'd been able to try that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we try to avoid that whenever we can. So the guts of what we're talking about today is really kind of the the workflow process of of booking and making sure that you do get the shot. Um, here are some bullet points you put together about at the time of the booking. Take us through mm -hmm. through these four points here. Um, I, the biggest one for us is that, you know, is clearly communicating with your clients. Um, you know, they should be there because they've seen some of your work. Um, they're there because they've connected with it. So you really want to make sure that, that you're showing and displaying work um, that kind of brings in the kind of client that you want. If you like shooting fun, quirky weddings, don't put up straight-laced, boring, black-tie affairs. You know, put up those pictures of guys who've got, you know, funky socks and bow ties and, you know, funny mustaches. Like, those are the kinds of things you want to make sure that you're projecting what you want to shoot. Um, and so when your clients come in, based on that, your job is to sort of help out. Um, let them know what they can expect for you. Lay it all out. Say, this is what we come, um, this is how we come, this is what we shoot, this is why we like to shoot this way. Um, you know, and then just sort of take them through the whole process. There's nothing worse than having clients um, who feel like they're in the dark. Um, when you were first of, starting yeah, out, um, how, how much leeway were you giving the, the potential clients to negotiate your price? Because I know that a lot of... A lot of younger photographers are, you know, they, they're afraid to mm -hmm. charge what they're worth or what the going rate is because they want to get those those first clients. Um, you know, there's no doubt about it. There's there's two things that you battle. One is if if you're brand new, your biggest battle is is that you need experience. Um, you know, I generally think it's best for you to try and get experience being a second shooter. Um, because it takes a little bit of the pressure off and you can, you know, somewhat, you can sort of get into some kind of a mentoring type situation. Um, that being said, in order for your business to take off, you do need to, you know, you need to get some work. Um, for us, I mean, I had a, we had a portfolio of families, family shoots, uh, stuff from my senior year in college photography portfolio and cars. So how do you book your first wedding with a portfolio like that? <laughs> right. well, you know, it was. It started as simple as we had a free weekend. We knew we had the gear, so that part was taken care of. Um, you know, through the car shooting stuff. So we said, "All right, here's our photos of cats and babies and families, and let us come shoot your wedding. We'll do it for free." So we took one weekend. We booked two weddings. We wanted to see if we liked it, um, and we got, uh, "Yay, we love all of them," from one client, and a, "Yay, we love ninety percent." So that was uh, how it started. So from there, you know, we, we started off at a really, you know, base price, shot um, or booked five clients at that price, bumped up our price, um, and then just sort of took it from there. I mean, we spent the first 
couple weddings, um, you know, at a, a pretty discount price because we were untested. We had no, yeah. you know, nothing to show for our work. So, uh, and and back then or, or now, are you collecting uh, a deposit? How, how do you manage kind of the the, the logistical parts of, of the business of wedding photography? Yeah, um, you know, so the big thing with clients is that we always impress upon them. It, it varies based on your state, but for us, we're always careful to not refer to it as a deposit, uh, but a retainer. Um, a deposit generally implies that it's refundable. Yeah. Um, a retainer is, listen, I'm going to secure you for this specific date, um, and if something should change, the retainer is the fee that it costs us to book you. Uh, whether or not you complete the job. So that's one thing. It varies by state. So, you know, having some legal uh, advice there is always helpful. Um, but generally what we do is we do 50% at the time of booking and then 50% a week prior to the event. Um, the reason we do a week prior is there's nothing more awkward uh, or will take a couple out of the moment of their wedding day than like, oh, let me get you a check. Right. Um, so... That's kind of how we like to work it. So paid in full before the wedding even starts. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's it, it, there's nothing worse, especially if it's the end of the night. Be like, ah, oh, can I have my check, please? <laughs> I mean, um, so. Um, the third bullet point here: avoid the vendor meal. Make it known you'll need to eat. <laughs> um, yeah, this is one even I still struggle with. Um, you know, I, I've I've yet to yet to have the. Um, uh, the fortitude to do it, but I, I swear, I think the secret is to just order a kid's meal. Um, they always come out first, uh, which is always the problem, because as a vendor, you're getting fed last, which is the most inopportune time to be fed, yeah. because your bride and groom have been fed first. So they're done their dinner for 15 or 20 minutes, and they're ready to like move on to the next thing. Um, so that's always tricky. Um, but yeah, you always want to make... I always bring this up at every meeting. Um, you know, We're generally shooting for... 10 or 12 hours yeah. by the time you factor in travel. So at some point I'm going to need to spend 10 minutes uh, and, and sit down and feed myself. <laughs> so um, it's a good time to sort of bring that up at the meeting and, you know, let the couple know that you are a human being. Do, do you pack some, you know, power bars in, in the, in the camera yes. bag just in case? Yeah, absolutely. That's a total necessity. If we can avoid having to eat them, that's great. Um, but you know, when, when your couple ends up, doing a surprise receiving line, which puts them 45 minutes behind schedule. Uh, you know, photographer eating time and photographer, photog you know, photo making time are the two things that go first. So have a plan B yeah. for sure. And you have three kids, so I guess you have a pretty good babysitter. We do, yeah. Thankfully, we've been pretty lucky in that department. Um, but, you know, especially because as a wedding photographer, you have the advantage of generally knowing... Um, at least several months in advance that you have a commitment. Um, so it's a great time to set up a babysitter, you know, come up with a child care plan. Um, having a backup is really important too. Uh, you know, wedding clients are generally not so understanding of, oh, hey, my kids are sick. Um, you know, it, you kind of have to, you've basically made a commitment um, as much as the couple who's getting married. Uh, to be there for them that day. So right. making sure that you've got this stuff covered ahead of time is great. So, um, Moving on to the next part uh, of, of venue research. Uh, mm -hmm. How often are you checking out the venue beforehand and, and how, do, how is that affected when you have a destination wedding? Um, so there's a couple different things. Destination weddings are obviously sort of their own breed. Um, you know, oftentimes it's you're, you're prohibited just from a cost standpoint of being able to get out there ahead of the wedding. Um, but I've got some tips sort of on, on how you'd approach that. Um, you know, for, for local weddings, if you're uncomfortable and you're just starting out, it's always helpful to spend some time at the venue. Um, if it's possible, it's, it's ideal to try and schedule time. And if you can meet with the, the site coordinator, the person who will be there that day, that's fantastic. Oftentimes, you know, they've got busy schedules, so that may not always work. Um, but this is where your couple can come into play if that's something that's important to them. Uh, you know, if it's a request from the, the couple, it generally is a little bit better uh, received than just from a photographer. So, 
um, you know, those people are sort of packed with incredibly valuable information. They'll be able to say like, oh, here, this patch of grass, this is where we're going to set up the chairs, and you can ask questions like, you know, which way are you going to send them down, and what direction do they come in from, and mm -hmm. where do they go after. Um, you know, it just sort of helps to build a rapport and an understanding of what will happen. Um, you know, the and I know a lot of these, a lot of the, the, the places that do uh, event hosting regularly require things like a certificate of insurance. Definitely. Um, and so, you know, in terms of, of that type of coverage, um, since we have a lot of people who are kind of new to the business, how, how important is that? And, and when did you acquire kind of business insurance for your photography? Um, well, it, from, you know, thankfully sort of carried over from, from the car industry, um, you know, as requiring, uh, as needing insurance, but it, it's definitely something that you want to have. Um, you know, it's incredibly important because there's there's just so many what ifs, uh, and there's nothing worse than jeopardizing you know your business or your livelihood um, over having you know someone's 85 year old grandmother accidentally trip over your light stand in the dark because it's dark. Yeah. Um, you know, and end up breaking an elbow. It, it, that's that's a horrible thing to have happen, um, and it's particularly awful if it jeopardizes your ability to you know continue your business. So having insurance is is incredibly important. Generally, especially if you have venues who are very you know particular about insurance, it's oftentimes because they've had an experience um, where the photographer photographer or something happened that cost them a lot of money. Um, you know, so always be sensitive to that. It's you know it's kind of really no way around it um, you know there are a lot of different providers out there uh, but you know shop around and see what you can find um, and and when when you have kind of special requests I mean I don't know if you've set up photo booths and and some of these uh, uh, a la carte services that are that people are offering does how much does that sort of complicate the the site walkthrough and the setup and the breakdown well I mean if there is anything outside of the ordinary of you just being a body there with your camera um, you know, those are things that's it's definitely helpful. Um, there's nothing worse than being at a venue and being like, oh, th this is the spot I'm going to set up my photo booth. And then, you know, you check it out on your site visit and you see that spot's empty and there's plugs and everything that you need and you're ready to go. Um, you show up day of and then all of a sudden you see there's this giant coffee bar, <laughs> you know, with like the chocolate fountain and all of the plugs that you planned on using and your space isn't there anymore. Um, you know, so those are things to kind of logistics that are helpful to make sure you have nailed down ahead of time. I've heard a lot of photographers who, you know, when they when they are shooting locally and they kind of know the venues where weddings are taking place, they really try to make friends with all of the vendors, the caterers, the the totally. event place, um, and even giving them, you know, here's a you can use one of my photos for your your you know promotional material, et cetera. I, mm -hmm. I guess stoking that network is very important for maintaining good relationships throughout all of the logistics of running the wedding. Absolutely. And it, there's no there's no relationship that's more important than the site, uh, than the venue. Um, you know, if you think of the hierarchy of, of a couple planning a wedding, the first is picking a date, which is usually dependent upon availability at the venue they want. Um, so they're they're generally at the top of the food chain. So if there's, you know, a person to be friends with, will say, oh my gosh, we worked with the most wonderful photographer. You should check them out. It's a, it's a referral because, wow, I worked with that photographer, Mike and Kate Duvall. They were so awesome. They helped me, you know, through that timing crunch. They were so, you know, happy and helpful. They gave me those images that I really wanted. Um, you know, it's the, the team bride uh, type scenario. If you, if you help the venue look good uh, for the bride, um, that's a huge plus. So yeah. that's the angle to work. Um, venue research, uh, kind of continuing what you can do online versus offline. Uh, take us through some of these uh, tips. Sure. So for for me, a lot of times because you know our our shooting web is quite a bit larger now, I and mean, we tend to shoot all over New England um, and and even outside of New England uh, now and again. So. A lot of times I end up doing uh, a lot of my research online. Um, so I'm a super technical geeky guy. Um, so you know, the, usually one of the first things I do is 
uh, I'll, I'll go to Google Maps and I'll look at the satellite view of the venue um, and you try to you know gauge like what time of day the photos at um, you I always use an app uh, there's a couple of them there's one called Sunseeker which is for the iPhone and Helios is another um, I think photographers ephemeris is another but basically it's a way for you to put in a location and you can actually see on a specific date where the sun is going to be in the horizon that's incredibly helpful <laughs> um, you know just knowing that the sun's gonna you know zip around the back of the building and it's gonna be you know right here at this particular time of day for sunset it it makes all the difference in the world for you to be able to you know end up at the right spot and get the light that you need um, so a lot of the stuff you can do online um, the other really helpful thing is look for other people who've shot the, the venue. Um, other photographer blogs, Google image search, you know, these are all things that will help you sort of visualize what the experience of shooting there will be. Um, you know, so those are all the, the kinds of things that I do ahead of a shoot if I'm not able to physically go there. Um, that that makes a, part of that a lot experience. of sense for kind of competitive reasons also just seeing you know the types of imagery and who yeah. you're up against yeah i like that yeah it's cool um the the pre-wedding questionnaire and actually mm -hmm. before we before we get to even the the you know shooting the wedding we had a few questions in regards to are you shooting kind of engagement photos and pre-wedding photos nowadays yeah yeah that's actually that's something that's well, that's funny i didn't put it in here but it's uh, you know the engagement session is an incredibly important part um, of what we do. It's it's really sort of like a test drive of what your service will be like. Um, the thing that I always like to tell our clients is that if you're not super jazzed up about doing engagement photos, it's totally understandable. It's sort of like doing senior portraits if you can think back to a time where you felt more awkward. Um, <laughs> I don't know many people who can. I mean, senior portraits is a really nerve-wracking time. Um, the advantage of an engagement session is it's senior portraits with a buddy. Um, so you, you generally you like this person enough to get them, you know, to get married to them. So you've got a, a partner in crime. Um, so you get a chance to see sort of how your couple acts in front of the camera. Um, and then your couple gets to, you know, experience what it's like to work with you from a photo standpoint. Um, you know, you can find out if they need a lot of direction, if they're, you know, awkward, they, they tend to stick, you know, an arm out in a funny direction. You get to sort of, you know, test these things out in a, you know, very low pressure environment. Um, and then you get to build rapport. Show up on the wedding day, it's, oh, Mike and Kate are here, not, oh, our photographers are here. Right. There's no ice breaking. Right. Um, and that's really important day of. Um. And these pre-wedding questionnaires, uh, I, I love this one about family dynamics. Mm. You should know how to avoid sensitive <laughs> subjects or different people yeah. shouldn't be shouldn't be standing next to one another for the family portraits. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it 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 happens. Life happens. Um, you know, and and a messy divorce can make for a really awkward situation. Um, so if you know about it in advance, and you can make you can make things happen seamlessly, uh, there's nothing better. You know, as anytime you can avoid a problem, it's a good thing uh, for your clients because, you know, your bride is there that you don't need them worried about the dynamics of the day. Um, so having this sort of information ahead of time is really helpful. Um, particularly, I mean, especially sensitive subjects like a recent death of a grandmother yeah. or, or something like that. I mean, you know, making sure that you don't put your foot in your mouth. They're like, all right, now let's do the photo of you and your grandma. Um, right. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of those helpful things. To put in there. Uh, is there often a, a wedding planner who's kind of coordinating the timeline for the day in the weddings that you've been Gen shooting? Yeah, generally the, they are commonly referred to as like day of coordinators. Um, weddings that have those are great um, in the sense that there's someone there kind of watching um, the time and keeping everyone sort of on pace. Uh, it varies greatly by the, by the actual coordinator. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes they're a blessing and a curse. Um, but that sort of comes with the territory. You know, part of the thing is being being sure that you know what you need to accomplish and communicating that um, to the coordinator ahead of time. Uh, we just had a recent wedding um, where the couple wanted close, you know, a, a humongous list of, um, 
of formal portraits. And we're like, that's great, we're incredibly efficient, and we're totally able to do this. The only problem is, is that I see that you've scheduled only about 30 minutes for 50 different portraits. Mm -hmm. So even if we're working at like a photo every 30 seconds, you know, we're still going to come up, uh, you know, really tight for timing. Um, so trying to figure those things out ahead of time uh, is important because the last thing you want is at the end of the wedding being like, oh, we didn't get those 20 portraits you wanted. And What do you find is kind of know, the appropriate of amount of time for portraits at a typical wedding with a typical shot list? Um, for us, to accomplish family photos, the bridal party, and then the couple photos, we can do it in as quickly um, as about 45 minutes, those three different things. We generally tend to prefer to have about an hour and a half. We like to sort of be able to fly through family in 20 minutes. Um, and that's, again, sort of leaving yourself a little bit of buffer for you know, the brother who needs to go in and use the restroom or right. the uncle who just had to go get a drink at the bar. Um, <laughs> you know, there's all of those, like, curveballs. So planning for those, um, you know, we like to try to have 45 minutes with the couple, if possible, um, just so that we can, you know, do multiple locations and, and sort of make everything work. Um, and for right gear, uh, a ton of questions about what sort of the minimum kit that you would go into a wedding with sure um i mean just starting out i know it's a it's a humongous investment um but i think the biggest favor you can do yourself is at the ver at the bare minimum make sure that you have a, an equivalent to a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200 you know those two lenses will get you started um if you're shooting a crop body camera uh, both nikon and canon um, that equivalent lens is the 17 to 55 2.8. Having the 2.8 is what allows you to get the shallow depth of field look, which is what that hallmark of professional photography is. Um, it allows you to shoot and not um, need a ton of flash power uh, at your reception, and it allows you to make images at the reception that are more than just a black hole background. And, um, you know, having uh, a camera body, a primary camera body, and a backup. Um, those are kind of the, the bare minimums. And I think the hardest thing when you're starting out is that you're always limited by gear. You know, if you've got a lens that's a 4.5 or 5.6 lens, you're going to be really hard-pressed to try and get, A, the images that look professional, and B, um, you know, be able to survive a, a dark reception. Right. So, uh, you know... This is sort of where the lens pro to go thing comes in. Um, if you're budgeting a couple hundred dollars per wedding to rent professional gear, you've all, all of a sudden accelerated the look and the capabilities and you know sort of your abilities to capture work. It's like you've leapfrogged two or three years. Um, you know there is a point in your business where it, it certainly makes sense to invest in those pieces of gear once you're a little bit more established and and you know that it's something that you use all the time um, that's sort of how you know I think it's sort of a leapfrog you don't have to go through those painful awkward years of using you know uh, crappy gear our last webinar with with you guys at lens pro to go kind of covered this whole question of uh, buy versus rent mm -hmm. um, and what what's kind of the general breakdown of math for how many times you'd have to rent before it was worth purchasing? Um, I would say that you know if you look at it from if you're shooting like ten events a year, and you figure the average rental um, for a lens like a seventy two hundred, you're in the ballpark of about a hundred to one hundred and ten dollars or so. Um, you know you can shoot with that for every one of your weddings and you've only paid for half of the lens. Right. So, you know, if you're shooting 20 events in a year, it probably makes sense to just buy it. But again, it all comes down to capital. Do you have that capital to buy? Yeah. Um, you know, and this is again sort of talking about the core gear, you know, 24, 70, 70, 200. When you start to get into prime lenses, um, something like an 85-1.4 or a 24-1.4, these, you know, close to $2,000 exotic primes, all of a sudden, you know, is that $2,000 actually, am I going to be able to utilize it every day? Right. Uh, or for every shoot? Probably not. Um, 
so it doesn't make sense to tie up that capital in an, an investment you know whereas you know having better business cards or more time for marketing or money to send a sample book to your favorite venue um, you know that's where that investment doesn't ne always necessarily uh, work out well and arguably by by doing the rental it it brings the, your cost of doing business much more in focus because you don't have this you know ca outlay of capital investment in, in, in your head you're not calculating the amortization of that spend exactly yep. but if you're spending uh, 200 bucks on a rental you know you better be making at least a thousand dollars if you're gonna get some profit out of that that wedding exactly exactly and that's the thing like people always exactly they forget that all right great I bought my 7200 hooray and all of a sudden three and a half years later they're like wow I've shot you know a hundred weddings with this thing and it's like on its last leg and oh no it stopped working ah oh. um, you know you feel like completely betrayed um, but it is it's just like a you know it's a, it's a piece of equipment yeah and um, you know it certainly has a lifespan and planning for that um, you know so that you start saving halfway through the lifespan is certainly an important thing to do so you said at the top of the presentation that you shoot 90 percent of the weddings with your wife Kate um, that's correct uh, and it is that presented always as a package deal or do you give an offer to say hey I'll, I'll shoot it by myself for this price but you can get two shooters for this price um, no we we keep it as part of you know our package deal it's funny because it's actually more work for us to shoot alone so I don't ever understand <laughs> I don't ever understand the, <laughs> the thought process of like oh one shooter it's, it's less work I'll charge you less money um, and the same thing with off-season I just don't get off season. Like I'm working just as hard at your wedding, whether it's November or, or you know, the middle of June or September. So there's no really. We don't ever do off season rates. We don't. We don't discount our packages. Our pricing is what it is, um, and you know we make that very clearly known. Um, if there's if there's ever a thing that you know we have to compromise, um, you know, to close a wedding that we really want to book, um, we'll do it. In, in sort of value for product, um, you know, or an additional additional hour of coverage. That's the other thing. Be because of our family situation, um, every hour that we're out of the house costs us money in, yeah. in babysitters and childcare. So, so we never do the oh all day coverage. Sure, abuse me. I'll be there 15 hours for your wedding. Um, you know, so we put a very clear um, you know cost for our time uh, in our pack. Yeah, that's good. You know, one other question in regards to rental, which is, uh, I would assume even though you work for a rental house, you're still advocating mm -hmm. that people are familiar with the equipment before they go and shoot oh uh, this God. very special yes. day, right? It's not like, <laughs> oh, I'm going to I'm gonna get the D4 this time, but I've never used it before. Yeah, I mean, certainly, we always, like for weddings, I mean, we always say to people, please, please, please have the gear arrive on Thursday. You know, that's part of the reason why we set up our rentals the way that we do. But, I mean, it's just it's irresponsible to have gear arrive the day before you're supposed to shoot. Um, because there's lots of things that can happen. I mean, it, it's, it, it could be something as simple as like, oh, my gosh, I got a phone call from my friend and I went outside to check on something and I missed the doorbell. And now all of a sudden, you know, the night before the wedding, you're stressed out because you're trying to drive to UPS to yeah. get the package or chase down the driver. I mean, avoid that situation whenever possible. Um, one week prior to the wedding, wrapping up the loose ends, what are you doing for, for one week before? Um, you know, it's basically making sure that the stuff that you're supposed to do two weeks before is done. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, for the most part, the, the stuff that tends to happen the one week prior is, you know, if the bride hasn't exactly nailed down what their timeline is or flow of the day, by all means, this is the time that you should be making sure that you have an exact idea of what the flow is. Um, you know, that pre-wedding questionnaire is going to, you know, you're going to ask for the addresses and the times um, and the names of everyone who's, you know, responsible for the wedding just to make sure there haven't been any changes. Um, but the one week before, you know, if you aren't shooting a ton of events, take your gear out make sure that it's working properly you know if you find out that you've got a lens that's back focusing this is the time to figure it out not 12 hours before you're supposed to shoot mm -hmm. um, you know and then uh, the other things are as simple as spend some time googling and see what else is happening around your venue there's nothing worse than saying like oh I'll leave I'll you know it's only takes me 45 minutes to get there I'll I'll leave at 120 thinking that you've got plenty of time 
um, you know, or leave an hour and 20 minutes ahead of time only to find out that there's a parade, <laughs> right. um, which has happened. <laughs> so it's like, oh, there's a parader. Oh, my gosh, we got a flat tire. Like, how long does it take you to change a flat tire on the side of the road? Yeah. 30 minutes? 15? Um, you know, putting in that buffer and, and figuring out that your, your timetable is important, too. So There's so many different websites and apps and whatnot. How, how are you sending a questionnaire to the bride? Uh, we have been very happy ShootQ users, um, mm -hmm. my gosh, since almost the start. Um, you know, ShootQ was, was brand new when we first joined. That has grown a ton. Um, it's inc I think the most helpful thing for us is purely just lead management. Um, you know, it automatically syncs with our Google Calendar. It alerts us to, you know, potential lead conflicts. Um, you know, we rate leads uh, with star rating based on their level of interest and where they're at in the booking process. Um, it just makes it really easy for us to keep on top of everything. There's a ShuQ app, so we can pull up their questionnaire, which they fill out online. Mm -hmm. You can build your questionnaire right in ShuQ. It gets mailed automatically. It takes a lot of the like um, back-end paperwork, boring, office-y stuff uh, and does a lot of that for you. So, I mean, it's it's a it's a payment that we're here happy to make every month. Yeah. And then one to days, uh, one to two days prior to the wedding, this is kind of mm -hmm. this is the crunch time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, this my ritual is always to sort of get you know batteries out, get them charging, uh, charge up the you know camera batteries, making sure those are good, making sure your memory cards are formatted. Oh, there's nothing worse than being in the heat of a moment grabbing a memory card from your you know your card wallet and, and seeing you press play and you see the photos from like the wedding from two weeks ago and you're like did I load this card <laughs> right. that's like not it's not the thing you want to be thinking about um, you know so get that stuff squared away clothes I put this on the checklist I can't say that I'm a hundred percent perfect at this but <laughs> it's from my own experience there's nothing worse than waking up before the wedding and be like oh no, we didn't do laundry. Like the shirt I need to wear for this <laughs> right. thing is dirty, and then you're like trying to dry it um, in the car by running the heat or like letting hanging the shirt out the window. I mean, just don't don't instill stress or comedy because of your clothes. Right? How much Febreze right. can you use on a shirt? Right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, filling up fill up your car with gas. Just, you know, don't. It's the little things that add up that you know that will mess you up for trying to be. Uh, to your event on time. How many memory um, cards are you taking to the typical wedding? It varies. Uh, we shoot, um, we try to shoot on smaller cards, um, and we have card wallets uh, that we keep on this. Okay. Make sure that you have a card wallet uh, and, and a system that's very clear for these are shot cards and these are cards that, you know, have images on them. And then keep your cards on you at all times. I know they look dorky, but there is absolutely nothing that you would be more in horror about than being at an event, having your camera bag not in your possession or at the reception or something like that, and you go to get a camera or a lens and your gear is stolen. Yeah. There is nothing you want to deal with less or more. I don't know what the... Anyways, you don't want to have to deal with having your gear stolen and an incredibly angry bride who has no wedding photos. Right. Um, so the memory cards are tantamount day of. Um, a lot of people, I, you know, it makes sense to number them and shoot them in sequence. Uh, so when you get home, it's very easy for you to say, all right, load card one, cards two, card three, card four, card mm -hmm. five. Um, it makes it a lot easier for you to make sure that you have everything. Uh, there's nothing worse than just making a rookie mistake and forgetting to load a card. And in terms of batteries for your camera, how many are you taking? And, and how do you deal? Um, I have a problem with, you know, batteries eventually lose their capacity to, to hold a charge. And sure. I'm always reluctant to throw them out. So, I, you know, I have these batteries that will hold half a charge. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should take it. Maybe I shouldn't. Are you kind of methodical about making sure that, you know, you're not using equipment for too long? Get get that out of there. Um, yeah, I for particularly for rechargeable batteries, um, if, if people, if you, okay, so if you, and I'm making the assumption that people are using um, nickel metal hydride rechargeable batteries, if you aren't, 
please just buy yourself some. Um, there are some some great ones out there. PowerX um, is a is a great brand. Uh, it's the ones that I've been using forever. Um, there are two different types. There's ones that are nickel metal hydride um, and have a higher capacity, usually like 27. I think they might be up to 2800 mAh. Um, and then there's this new type of battery. The problem with those batteries is that they would lose one to two percent of their charge per day if you didn't use them. Mm -hmm. So that's why I got in that methodology of charging up my AA camera batteries the night before. There are new batteries which are called, I think PowerX is called iMedian, um, which is a little less capacity, but they hold their charge for six months. Oh, wow. um, so those have really made my you know pre-wedding ritual a lot more convenient. Um, there are lots of intelligent chargers, ones that will actually read out the capacity of the battery. Um, those are pretty geeky, but I have one of those, and that's sort of how I manage my battery fleet to say, okay, well, you know, this these batteries are not really ready for prime time any longer, yeah. and they get relegated to like the kids' toys or something like that. The um, the third bullet point, man, time syncing your cameras. I I got to be honest, I, I've traveled a lot this past year. I don't even know what time zone my cameras are in, but I guess if you're shooting yeah. an event with two people and multiple cameras. You really want those those times to be in sync. Totally. Um, what I always do, if, if you're at home, um, the URL is incredibly simple. It's time.gov, uh, and that syncs to the U.S. atomic clock. Um, you click your time zone, it gives you the time. It's like It looks like it's the web from 1996, but <laughs> it works. Um, and on my iPhone, I have an atomic clock um, app, which I can pull out. And so if I have a second shooter who isn't synced up yet, I know that all of my cameras are synced to this one standard, um, and it might as well be the, the most accurate time that you can get. Yeah. So uh, it makes it really a lot easier when you're looking at two different cameras to say, like, oh, did I get this moment? Um, you know, being off by 10 or 15 seconds can make it a, a nightmare in Lightroom when you're trying to compare, like, oh, which shot of the kiss is better? <laughs> right. Um, so that's what we do. Um, so here's the, the touchy subject of cleaning the sensor. Um, mm. there, you obviously can do a lot of damage. Uh, to your camera or to a rental camera, if you don't know what you're doing, um, so what's kind of the what's kind of the, the neophyte way to go about cleaning the sensor? Is it just use the, some air, and if that doesn't work, just let it go? Yeah, I mean it, that's that's the the down and dirty thing in the field is if you if you can tell that you've got something. The problem with cleaning your sensor is that unless you're actively looking for sensor dust, you're probably not going to see it until you get home. Um, but in theory, you should have checked it out before you were in the heat of the moment at the wedding. Um, you know, cleaning your sensor, it has this mystique of being this incredibly difficult, I need to be wearing a lab coat and have a PhD to do it. It's not that complicated. It's just a matter of having the right tools. They are expensive, though. Um, you know, using the swabs from a company like Visible Dust, I mean, by the time you're done, you're spending 100 and Tend to if you add in a loop so you can actually see the dust, close to two hundred dollars or so, uh, which can seem like it's it's an incredibly unsexy way to spend camera photography money, um, but it's sort of a necessity. Um, the actual cleaning part isn't that hard. We you know at Lensbro to Go we've got this sensor loop which is you know lit with LEDs. Um, you know you flip up the mirror in the cleaning mode, you put the loop there and you can actually see the dust you know where it is so you know what you're going after. Um, fortunately, Canons tend to be pretty good with dust. Nikons, on the other hand, uh, generally require a little bit more TLC. Um, but it's just a matter of having the right tools and the fluid on hand um, to clean it. It's not that hard. You, yeah. know, you, use a, you use a swab once, you make one swipe, you make sure you put just you know one or two drops of the fluid, whatever is specified, um, and then you give it 10 or 15 seconds to permeate you know, the swab. You make that, that quick swipe. And um, sometimes you go through two or three swabs. Um, but that's just how you do it. So. Um, a lot of questions on how many uh, images are you shooting at a wedding? And, and what do you kind of guarantee or what do you tell the, the, the bride that you're going to give her at the end of the wedding? Sure. For, for an eight-hour wedding, we're generally shooting between, between myself and... Uh, and Kate, we generally are shooting 2,500 to 3,200 images. Um, we've our, that number has been coming down for us. Um, generally, what we've been you know 
saying to clients is that we'll deliver seven to nine hundred images. Um, and that's totally doable, but we've been starting to get even more selective about what we deliver. Um, you know, because we we've determined that if you provide a client with a file that is one that you would consider as like, eh, it's okay. Uh, you know, I'm not embarrassed to have it out there, but you know, it's a passable photo. Um, invariably, that's the one that ends up getting posted on Facebook or ends up everywhere. Mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, like I wish I hadn't. You know, so um, <laughs> be be really hard on yourself for your editing. You know, I'd much rather deliver um, as we're starting to deliver more in the like five to seven hundred range. I'd much rather deliver five hundred unbelievable, amazing, killer images. Um, you know, than than give them. You know, quantity over quality. So. I've heard a lot of um, discussion and debate over, you know, whether wedding photographers should just deliver the digital files and, and the couple can do whatever they want with them or whether we're still in the mm -hmm. business of selling prints or larger scale canvas wraps, et cetera. What, what are you personally doing? I mean, I look at myself. I can't tell you the last time it was that I bought a print or, or had a print made of a photo I took. Um, you know, so I think Unfortunately, that business model has passed. Uh, it still, ex you know, it still exists. If you are again sort of setting the expectations for your client um, that hey, listen, it's really important for me to show you the work, you know, big. I want you to have prints. I want you to like. I want this work to be on display. I want you to be, you know, have this as a showcase. Um, if you're going to set that expectation, that you know, at the beginning, that's the time to do it. Show them what you want to sell them. Um, one of the coolest things we just actually uh, partnered up with Lens Pro, Lens Pro to Go. We just partnered up with an awesome uh, app called Preveal, which is makes it incredibly easy for you to put up. You basically put up an eight and a half by eleven piece of paper in a space. You take a photo, um, either with your camera or like an iPad, and then you you can basically virtually show a customer that that sixteen by twenty that they think is a huge print, you know, looks like a four by six on their wall when you put it over their couch. Hmm, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, if if selling prints is important to you, um, make sure that you you put that in as part of your, um, you know, as part of your your pitch. Um, but when you are delivering the files, are you are you being pretty specific about how they can use them? For example, I guess oh, yeah. Facebook is is yeah. game. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we let the couple know that. I mean, we're we're really laid back. Um, you know, we always let the couple know that. By giving you the disc, we still retain the copyright. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not selling you the copyright. These are still our photos. We still took them. We will use them for marketing purposes. Um, you know, we are the the end arbiters of deciding whether or not a photo gets published in a magazine or something like that. So, those are expectations we set up ahead of time. If the couple wants to, you know, have prints made, we guide them to a a lab whose quality that we you know, we trust. I say, please don't take them to Walmart. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but for the most part, couples just want to know that they have, you know, they have those files. Um, so we give them to them just, you know, sort of with that asterisk of, you know, yes, these are yours by all means, you know, put them on a coffee mug or whatever. Um, you just, you can't sell them. And if you're delivering 700 to 900 photos or 500 photos, whatever the number may be, what, what sort of post-production are you doing on each image? And, and do you have other retouching packages when they, they have, you know, a special image that they want to really, you know, go to town with? Sure. Um, one of the, you know, it's funny, I'm a perfectionist when it comes to files. Um, but part of one of the things that, you know, like two years into our photo career, as wedding photographers, we figured out that we were spending a lot of time chained to a desk, you know, manually adjusting images, adjust an image, adjust an image. Um, so we made a conscious decision. We actually stopped shooting raw. We started shooting JPEG. Really? Um, and that was what we considered, we called it taking the training wheels off. Um, and it made us responsible for learning manual exposure, learning manual Kelvin white balance. Um, and it put us in the driver's seat to, to be smarter than our cameras. Um, so thankfully, that was the boot camp that really kicked us into shape um, that lets us really go after every photo to try and nail it as closely as possible in camera. Um, that also affords us our ability to do slideshows same day. 
um, at the event. We actually pick about 100 images or so um, just after introductions, and then we display those at the reception you know, on an iMac, which is the greatest marketing, I think, that we do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, you know, that's sort of what we did to sort of push ourselves forward. Um, so thankfully, on the back end, our, our post-production, other than, you know, my making tweaks and subtle tweaks and contrasts that I wonder if clients even know, um, it makes our post life a lot easier. Um, I can't believe how fast the hour went by because I still have about a oh million gosh, questions. Yeah, wow. <laughs> um, you know, uh, obviously, uh, this is co sponsored and produced by Lens Pro to Go, but a lot of people uh, are asking for your personal website. They want to see the work that you have. Um, can you go ahead and give out sure. your URL there? Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's MKD Photography, so sort of like Mike and Kate Duval Um, You know, by all means, feel free to stop by and, and, and take a peek. Um, you know, I'll, I'll certainly be happy to try and field anything or if you guys, uh, if there's a preponderance of questions, um, who knows, maybe we can do a part two. And, uh, as we mentioned before, Lens Pro to Go being one of the, the major rental houses, uh, here in the U S, um, you know, ton of lenses, uh, camera bodies, video gear too. If that's something that you're looking to get into, that's Lens Pro to Go. You can follow them on Twitter at Lens Pro to Go and then on their Facebook page, facebook.com slash Lens Pro to Go. They also have a pretty cool blog um, where they test different lenses <laughs> and talk talk shop, which I love. LensProToGoLabs.com is that. Uh, and yeah. Mike, a very generous offer here: ten percent off your rentals with the code Wedding Checklist. Um, Definitely. Mike mentioned a bunch of apps, a bunch of sites uh, through the course of this. We're gonna list those tomorrow on our blog along with this recording. So if you missed any of that, don't don't have a panic attack here. We'll put that all on our blog tomorrow at blog.photoshelter.com. Uh, and I want to let you know about our next uh, webinar coming up next Tuesday, September 24th, with Jared Platt talking about Lightroom 5 tips for automating your workflow and portfolio. So again, if you're one of these people that are shooting 3,000 images uh, at, a, at a wedding event and you want to figure out some best practices for the, the workflow, uh, please join us for that. And there's a little URL there in the corner, bit.ly slash Lightroom Platt. Uh, to register for, register for that. But I want to thank uh, Mike and Lens Pro to go for joining us today. Mike, thank you so much for joining us from Concord, Massachusetts. Definitely. Glad to be here. And uh, thank you to the audience for joining us and spending the last hour and two minutes with us. Hope you learned something and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.